Hello, good evening, and welcome. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, for this important debate on Darfur. And especially want to thank um, Mr. John Prendergast, um, Professor Rosenblum, and Professor Mamdani for being here. Um, I just want to recognize some of the groups that helped put this event together and make this possible. Um, the, uh, sorry, the Institute of, for African Studies, SIPA's Pan-African Network, the Humanitarian Affairs Working Group, the Graduate Committee on, on, African, on African Studies, the Center for African Education, the Conflict Resolution Working Group, the UN Studies Working Group, the Arab Students Association, the Center for International Conflict Resolution, and Brooklyn for Peace. Tonight, our moderator is Professor Peter Rosenblum. He's a professor in human rights at the fac and the faculty co-director of the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School. Professor Rosenblum has worked with many major international human rights groups, including Human Rights Watch and Global Rights. He is a member of the Human Rights Watch Africa Division Ad Advisory Committee, a consultant to the Carter Center, and serves on the board of several non-governmental organizations. Much of his recent work has focused on the confluence of natural resources and human rights issues around the world with special emphasis on Africa. He'll now take us through the debate format and introduce our two debaters. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers. I, and uh, I think it's really just a, a, a marvelous opportunity for us all. I think for any of us who've been thinking about Darfur, we have moments of internal debate moments of struggle with the issues, and often when we reach out to read what's in the public, we start to wonder whether such different views of reality can coexist. <laughs> Here's our opportunity to, uh, to, to see in, in, in action two uh, spokesmen and articulators of, of views that, for in those terms, often do seem as if they must exist in, in separate worlds and separate realities. Are we talking about genocidal acts in a counterinsurgency on the cheap, or a planned and organized genocide from the very top with ethnic and racial dimensions? Are we talking about 400,000 dead or 100,000? Are we talking about a problem understandable in the abstract or one that can only be understood with a deep understanding of context in terms of colonialism, imperialism, and the war on terror? All of these, I think, are, are issues that hopefully we'll be hearing about tonight we're going to leave it to our speakers to define those issues and to lay out the terms of the debate and then to be able to respond to each other. Um, the terms, the, the arrangement that we have will be for each speaker first to present their, their, their view of the problem of Darfur in Sudan. John Prendergast will speak first and then um, Mahmoud Mamdani. After that, each will talk for 15 minutes again about the way forward. And then in the final 10 minutes, each will, uh, will, will offer some rebuttal statements or final statements before we go on to 30 to 40 minutes of question and answer. Before I turn to the speakers, I, I just wonder if we might, uh, for, for the speakers and for ourselves, get a sense of, of who we have in the audience today. How many uh, of you are undergraduates at Columbia or elsewhere in the community? And uh, how many of you are in a PhD program at Columbia or elsewhere in the community? How many of you are in one of the professional schools, the School of Public Health or Teachers College, the law school, SIPA? <laughs> oh, what have I left out? I don't have a nursing school. I'm not so, sorry? Social work. Social work. All right. Yes, great. And then other, uh, others, other people in the community? Oh, my god. Invaders from another galaxy. <laughs> yes, excellent. OK. All right, well, thanks very much. I'm expecting, um, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm expecting a very civil discussion. I, uh, it turns out that our two speakers seem to get along well. I thought I was going to have to sit between them. And, and I was already considering you know, my lost friendships that, uh, along the way. But no, I think we're off to uh, a wonderful evening. So thanks very much. I'm not going to go on describing the two of them, because I think you all know why they're here. So I'll just leave it since I got to be introduced, but I wasn't in the program, <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll hold that over on the others. Great, Peter. Thanks a lot. I, I, it may be a, an explanation for uh, why we're getting along so well. I, I, uh, I can be a fairly contentious, cantankerous, even carcinogenic person <laughs> at times, mind you. And, and since I actually like uh, Professor Mamdani a great deal, 
as a human being, I decided to eat, uh, decided to eat all my chocolate Easter bunnies on the way up here on the train ride, so I'd be really nice and sweet tonight, so I hope it works, and I saved an extra bunny for you, Professor Mountain. <laughs> if you're nice to me, too. Um, a second thing before I start is that as one begins to glide into midlife, when one reaches the age that- You're looking that, at me for Oh, it. I'm pulling you right in, baby. I know how old you are. Most of us are, are beset you know, by, by some of the usual questions of, of identity and purpose. So in, in doing my research on Professor Mamdani's positions regarding the topic tonight, I was relieved to have a number of my identity issues answered by his uh, writings. Uh, it turns out that as a, being a Sudan activist as I am, I have learned uh, from, from his, his writings that I'm actually uh, a neocon controlled by Jewish lobbies who want to save Darfur through military occupation as a result of the war on terror, which sharpens my focus on demonizing Arabs and ultimately fronts for my desire to recolonize Africa. <laughs> it's all clear now. I know what my purpose is in life. So seriously though, in this first section, uh, in this first part of the debate and discussion, um, we are talking about the problem in Sudan. So we're going to follow these rules accordingly. And rather than get too abstract right off the bat, I'd just like to start with today's problems, uh, as in April 14, 2009, and, and try to put myself in the shoes of a refugee or a displaced person. If I was one of the nearly two million displaced people in Darfur today living in one of the camps, I have a few problems of a fairly immediate nature. It turns out that since uh, President Bashir kicked out the main NGOs uh, servicing Darfur with humanitarian assistance in my camp, uh, we no longer have chlorinated water. And I'm scared to death for my kids that someone will contact cholera someone in, somewhere in the camp and then we'll really be up the creek because if one person contracts it, many, many more will as it spreads like wildfire. I'm also concerned that the NGO that used to, and this is something most of us don't know, that used to vacuum all of the human waste out of the latrines on a daily basis no longer does that since the day that President Bashir issued his edict that these NGOs must leave. Human waste is spreading everywhere in my camp and the temperatures are going up in Darfur every week as we glide slowly into the rainy season in less than two months. And this means that diseases will spread crazily because of these conditions. Now I haven't even begun as a resident of this camp to think about the coming interruptions in food and medicine due to the expulsions, but they are coming. We have been told by the agencies that the pipeline is slowly closing down because we don't have the service delivery capacity. And it is embarrassing, frankly, to even talk about one of my most difficult problems, and that is that my 15-year-old daughter was raped looking for firewood last week. The NGO that was expelled in our camp have been documenting a rise in sexual assaults by paramilitary groups roving around the camps. And the local administrator had been telling the head of that NGO that their days in Sudan were numbered. I guess he was right. So I myself only came back to, the, to my family right there in the camp a few months ago. I had been with one of the rebel groups, but was fed up with the infighting in this organization and the abuses that the rebel group was committing. One day, I just decided to quit and come back and come back to the camp. Now I hear rumors of a new challenge. I hear about government, government attacks on IDP camps and that part of the reason for the NGO expulsions is to dismantle the vast camp structure, which has been sort of the incubator uh, for the continuing rebellion in Darfur. This would be devastating, I can tell you. Unless there is peace, we have nowhere to go. Uh, as bad as these camps are, they are better than the threats we face from predatory militias that await us in our villages we come from if we have to leave these camps, if these camps are broken up. It is shameful that we are reduced to hoping for some kind of help from faraway lands and faraway people who have mercy on us. But that is where we are today. That is the problem 
in Sudan today. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my attempt to summarize the immediate challenges faced by Darfurians based on the eight trips that I have taken personally into Darfur since the uh, most recent conflict began in 2003. So how did we get to this point? Where some of the most self-reliant people that I have ever met in my life, the people of Darfur, unfortunately are just waiting for some solution to come from someplace far away. Well, I think for the half century, and I, this is my quick explanation, for the half century that, that Sudan has been an independent country, it has been deeply, deeply troubled, as we all know. The former colonizers of Sudan, Egypt and Great Britain, turned over a country at independence that was profoundly unequal. And for these last five decades, a very small group at the center of Africa's largest country has controlled everything and used overwhelming force to destroy any opposition. And we all probably know that the largest manifestation of that inequality and concentration of power has played itself out in the southern part of the country, where the oil is, most of the oil at least, where the southerners since independence have fought two wars uh, for first uh, independence and second for a new Sudan, as they call it, though they will get their referendum if things go uh, as planned, which they never do, in 2011. So Darfur, the western part of the country, is just the latest symptom of a diseased state called Sudan. Now to fight the rebellion in Darfur, the government of Sudan committed what I believe, though I wouldn't fall on my sword for it, what I believe is genocide. And uh, genocide is a unique crime in which the perpetrator, as the definition says, intends to bring about the conditions which will lead to the destruction in whole or in part of a particular group of people based on their identities. In this case, the government of Sudan has targeted three non-Arab ethnic groups for uh, destruction in, that, in the manner that the, uh, that the genocide determination, uh, uh, genocide convention outlines. The four people, the Zagawa people, and the Masalid people. Now these aren't random uh, ethnic groups that the government just one day decided to, to come after with helicopter gunships and, and paramilitary forces. These are the bulk, the backbone, just like the Dinka were of the SBLA in the south, these were the backbone, are the backbone of the Darfurian rebel groups, splintered as they are. And so they had decided, made a very clear decision that they were going to target these groups. The oldest the oldest counterinsurgency strategy in the book, drain the water to catch the fish. You try to cut the umbilical cord between the uh, liberation movement or rebel group or militia or whatever you want to call it, insurgency, and the people who would provide its sanctuary and support to allow that fish to travel in the water of the Sahara Desert. Um, so to accomplish the task of destroying those ethnic groups in some way, shape, or form, the government of Sudan decided to organize and arm the militias that we have come to be, come to, that have come to be known here in the West collectively as the Janjaweed. They're a very decentralized and dispersed uh, set of, of militias and, or, and, and groups at the local level. And they are, I think, they are in some strange way Darfur's version of the Ku Klux Klan. Like the KKK, they represent only a very small percentage of the sentiment of the people of Darfur, or the larger population of Sudan. And it's the most extreme sentiment, just as the KKK was and is here in the United States. But they have the guns, courtesy of the government of Sudan and its counterinsurgency strategy of contracting paramilitaries to to undertake the ethnic cleansing that we saw pre, uh, carried out in 2003 and 2004. And they went about their work, I think, with fairly deadly efficiency. <clears throat> we have at least satellite evidence and all of the efforts that have been made to collect testimonies on the ground and document what, what happened and where, what, uh, what went on. And about 1,500 villages were burned to the ground 
during that, during the height of the counterinsurgency, the, the, the main push uh, in 03, 04, and early 2005. This isn't divide and conquer, this is divide and destroy. And it's not a secret, it's not a, it's very hard to figure out why the government would want to do this. I mean, first and foremost, they have a lot to lose. Um, they've been in power now for 20 years, committed a lot of atrocities, the first thing, and they're a very unpopular uh, regime. And uh, certainly uh, will, would like to send a message to any would-be rebel that this is the fate that awaits you. And they have a lot to lose in the form of economic benefits. As we all know, since the late 1990s, Sudan has catapulted from a exporter of gum Arabic to a mid-level producer of oil. And that oil is not going for development, <laughs> building roads and uh, agricultural projects for the people of all throughout Sudan. That is going into the coffers of many of the leading uh, figures in the National Congress Party, the ruling party in Sudan. And it goes for buying weapons. Um, so it's maintained power by any means necessary, if you will. So ultimately, the problems in Sudan, since that's the first panel, the, which are you know, the roots of conflict, maldevelopment, marginalization, over-concentration of power in the center, and a willingness to use any means necessary to maintain that power, because it's a small group of people. These problems have been left completely unaddressed by external efforts and by the efforts of the, uh, with the exception of the North-South peace deal, the efforts of Sudanese internally. And as long as they remain, as long as these problems, these fundamental root causes remain unaddressed, then we're going to continue to have forums like this, I think, uh, focusing on, predictably, on the problems in Sudan. So hopefully in the second section, when we go into the, uh, uh, we can get, when we go into what must be done, the way forward, I think, is the title, then we will be able to talk about the solutions, because there are solutions. Africa is full of solutions, and I hope we can get a chance to talk about some of them in that second section. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Yes, Ron Dunn. If you don't mind, I'll... Uh, I want to thank the students who organized this. Um, I don't think I did any research on John. <laughs> uh, so I have nothing to say about John. What I have to say is about the uh, conflict in Darfur. When I first uh, heard of uh, the Darfur conflict, uh, I was struck by one thing. Uh, I work on uh, one of the things I work on is internal conflict in Africa. And uh, I'm used to African conflicts happening as if in the dead of the night. Uh, Rwanda, Angola, Congo. But Darfur was different. Darfur seemed globalized, uh, more than life size. Uh, there seemed to be an enormous media hype about Darfur. Um, there was no problem of getting people to know that there was a conflict and a tragedy unfolding in Darfur. And as I followed this, um, what I thought was an unusual phenomenon, and I asked myself why, I realized that the answer was very simple. The answer was that Darfur was the subject of a domestic movement in the US. Unlike Rwanda, unlike Congo, unlike Angola. And that movement had driven the message. It had even driven politics in Congress. It had been spectacularly successful. And I decided to follow this message. As Rumsfeld would say, connect the dots. <laughs> so the first dot, the first mega publicity was about how many have died. I came across this in uh, 2006 when the Government Accountability Office 
which is an audit agency of the U.S. government, it got together with the U.S. Academy of Sciences, appointed 12 experts, asked them to look at six different estimates of mortality in Darfur at the height of the violence, 2003-2004, asked them to look at the methodology and to say which ones were reliable, which ones were not. The high-end estimates were 400,000 coming from Save Darfur Connected researchers. And the low end was 70,000 coming from the World Health Organization. All 12 experts without exception said that the Save Darfur estimates were the least reliable. They were based on unrepresentative samples and generalizations over a vast population. The most reliable actually was CRED. Uh, which had roughly an estimate, which was a WHO research affiliate in Europe, roughly an estimate of something like 112,000. The difference between 112,000 and 400,000 is enormous. That was 2006. But 2007, I kept on seeing ads in subways in New York City and on buses, 400,000 already dead from Save Darfur, right? With absolutely no concern or interest in what may be the truth on the ground. I became more interested in the dots. The second dot was about the causes of death, because the Save Darfur messages seemed to imply that these 400,000 had died of violence. They were killed. And I realized the, there was a difference between the numbers killed and the numbers who had died. And the difference was that the deaths were from multiple causes. The WHO research and the CRED research pointed out that there were two causes. One cause was drought and desertification. The United Nations Environmental Program pointed out last year in its research that the southern rim of the Sahara had expanded 100 kilometers over 40 years, from the 40s to the 1980s. And this expansion had forced the nomads of the north down south. Well, the WHO estimates pointed out that something like 70 to 80 percent had died from the effects of drought and desertification, mostly young children and infants who had died from diarrhea and dysentery. 20 to 30 percent had died from direct violence. Now, there is a ground for legitimate debate. And the ground for legitimate debate is how many of those who died of dysentery diarrhea would have survived if there was no conflict, if assistance had come in time? And I don't deny that. That's an area of legitimate debate. But all I'm pointing out is that there was not one cause of death. There were multiple causes of death. There was a third factor, which I thought was enormously, was not exaggerated. It simply wasn't mentioned. What wasn't mentioned was that this conflict had a history. That the conflict had actually begun even before the present government in Sudan came into power in 1987-89. If you read the literature on Darfur and you talk to researchers or people there on the ground, they will tell you that before 1987, conflicts in Darfur were between neighbors they were localized and they were easily settled through reconciliation conferences. But something changed in 1987. The conflict became an all Darfur conflict. The level of brutality was horrendous and the numbers that died were terrible. The best writing on this is by a Darfuri anthropologist called Sharif Harir, who is today actually one of the leaders of, the rebel, of one of the rebel movements. Sharif Harir, in his writing, Sharif Harir was present at the resolution of the conflict in 1989, and he recorded the speeches of the secretaries on both sides. Both were primary school teachers. One interesting thing is this, that already in 1989, one side was talking of genocide. Indeed, the word used is Holocaust, not genocide. And the other side is talking of ethnic cleansing. Both sides see themselves as victims in the conflict. 
That was 87-89. Now, why did the 87-89 conflict happen? The 87-89 conflict happened for three reasons. The first reason was a background reason, which is the nature of colonialism in Darfur. The nature of British colonialism, when it got control of Darfur, it divided up the land completely between different tribes. So Darfur became a patchwork of tribal homelands, except that peasant tribes got large homelands and the most nomadic tribes, the camel tribes of the north, got no homeland because they had no settled villages because they moved around the year. Second cause was the drought and desertification. As the Sahara expanded, it pushed the northern nomads down south, and they headed for the best land in central Darfur, around the mountain massif, known as Jabal Mara, 70 kilometers of land, and began a classical ecological conflict in Darfur. The third contributory cause was that Darfur was neighbor to Chad, and there was a civil war in Chad from 1960, from independence onwards, and the two sides in the Civil War were armed by two sides in the Cold War by the 1980s. The Reagan administration, France and Israel, armed one side, Gaddafi and the Soviet Union armed the other side. By mid-1980s, Darfur was without water, but it was awash with guns, with AK-47s, and that explained the level of killing in this Civil War in Darfur. My point is that the Western powers were involved in the Darfur conflict before the government of Sudan was involved. And furthermore, the present government was not even in power at the time. So if we want to hold anybody accountable, we should begin with where the conflict begins. Now let's go on to the present phase of the conflict, which begins in 2003. Who is fighting whom? Save Darfur has been talking of the Janjaweed. Um, I worked as a consultant for the African Union for a year. Um, and my job as a consultant was basically to attend meetings of traditional leaders like chiefs, of political parties, opposition and government, of uh, NGOs and community groups, of women's representatives, of intellectuals, and of representatives of IDPs to to read their reports, to sit in, to listen to the discussion, and to say which point of view was not being covered and which issue was not being represented in the discussion. It was an ideal job for a researcher. The group that I worked for did a research, and what came out of this research on the conflict was that actually the conflict was along two axes, north-south and east-west. The north-south conflict was the one between the northern nomads and the southern peasants, which is where the Janjaweed of the north comes in. And the south-south conflict was between different nomadic groups. The only thing that made sense of both the conflicts was that it was everywhere between those with homelands and those without homelands. This was the big factor. But the east-west conflict has been obscured in the safe Darfur messages. They only talk of the north-south conflict as an Arab-African conflict. If anybody is interested, we can then discuss, outside of my time limit, the question of Arab and Africa. The final question. The final question was that in my work, I became aware that actually after 2005 January, the level of deaths in Darfur had declined dramatically. Three weeks ago, I was at a meeting in Addis Ababa um, of an of a African Union panel on Darfur. And one of the people addressing the panel was the commander of the UN forces in Darfur. 17,400 UN forces. Part of their job is to follow up a report of every death of a civilian and file a report how many died of what causes? According to the commander of the UN forces, the total number of civilian dead in Darfur throughout the year 2008 were 1,500. That is less than 135 a month, less than what would be considered an emergency by the United Nations anywhere else in the world. But you would not know this if you listen to Save Darfur. I don't know about John. I hope that John is not surprised by these figures. But 
You wouldn't know it if you listen to Save Darfur propaganda. You would think that the situation is worsening. You would not know that there has been a dramatic decline. Um, my final point is this. Why did, how much time do we have left? You have four minutes. Four minutes, great. Why did the violence go down? The violence went down, unlike what you've heard. The violence went down because of the African Union intervention. The African Union has been the only group in Darfur which has begun with the assumption and stuck to the assumption that the solution to this problem can only be political. It cannot be a military solution. That the solution cannot be an external intervention from the outside, a military type intervention, but the only external intervention which would make sense is one that would bring different sides in the conflict together. The African Union is the only one that managed to bring them together in Jamena. And when it brought them together, there was an agreement with the big powers in the West. The agreement was that Africa would provide the bodies on the ground, the soldiers, and the big powers would provide the logistics and the funding. The US government pledged to give $50 million, but did not give a cent, not one cent. The Canadians pledged to provide helicopters and pilots, but they rented civilian helicopters from Eastern Europe and hired civilian pilots from Eastern Europe. Civilian pilots have the right to refuse to go into a battle zone. The European Union promised to pay the salaries of the African Union soldiers. When I was in Darfur in 2007, they had not been paid their salary for eight months because the European Union said they were not sure that the money was going to Darfur. They thought there was corruption in Addis Ababa. I have never heard a war where because the bureaucrats are corrupt, the soldiers are not paid. Well, if you're not paid for eight months in a strange country, how do you live? All kinds of corruption proliferated. And all of this was reported in the press. The point was to discredit the African Union soldiers and to replace them with a UN command. The point was not to replace the soldiers. The soldiers remained on the ground. The point was to shift the command from Africa to New York. This has been a systematic attempt, a systematic attempt to discredit both any kind of political solution, any kind of African solution to an African problem. And instead, there has been a call for external intervention and military intervention, starting with a no-fly zone, which I will come to my notion of what is a better solution later. Thank you. Thank you. Been, I'm being happily rendered entirely irrelevant. I don't even have any time to keep. John? We're going into, what are we doing now? We're in 15 minutes of the way forward oh, now. So uh, no, no, uh, the rebuttal isn't supposed to start until I the see. next step. Yeah. Now it's the way okay. forward. You could hijack the thing if you wanted to. <laughs> but hey, we'll respect the, the process. Way forward, yes. Boy, there's a lot I want to respond to, but we shall wait for later with extreme discipline. Um, the way forward, I want to talk about the major diplomatic opportunity that exists in, in Darfur today. Um, with all of the contentions and differences in the international system, where the United States, with the, against the backdrop of Iraq and all that that spawned in terms of divisions, and Lebanon and, and even Afghanistan going forward, uh, remarkably, despite all that we just heard and despite all of the the divisiveness that the Security Council of the United Nations has experienced on Darfur. Remarkably, there does exist a fairly substantial uh, consensus for peace in Darfur globally. Uh, China, Arab League, African Union, European Union, United States, most Sudan's population. Uh, everyone wants peace, but we're not working together for it, multilaterally, internationally. Uh, this is where I think the greatest opportunity exists for the new administration in Washington, uh, and the new president and his new envoy, Scott Gratian. A deal 
for Darfur, a peace deal for Darfur is available to be brokered. Um, uh, and the need for international cooperation to implement the North-South peace deal uh, has never been more urgent. I had the, the opportunity to meet with uh, President Obama a week and a half ago about Sudan in the West Wing to talk about the way forward. And his special envoy was about to go out uh, on his first trip. And I found uh, refreshing, uh, after quite a number of years of obfuscation and uh, divided uh, um, efforts during the previous administration, efforts that were deeply undermined by our counterterrorism relationship with the Sudanese government, deeply um, undermined by our fear of upsetting China with respect to many of our other equities in the bilateral relationship with that country, uh, and our diversion, the diversion of our energy assets and resources and attention to Iraq. It was refreshing to see the President stride into the room and say very, very clearly and confidently, it's better than any Sudan expert in the United States government could have possibly stated, that there will be many challenges. There will be every day a fire hose of emergencies that come out of the spout that is Sudan. But we will focus our attention and maintain our attention on the uh, strategic prize, which is peace in the country. And that means supporting peace in Darfur and implementing peace in the, between the North and the South and ensuring against conflict in the east and the far north, where rumblings are always heard. I spent this morning uh, along those same lines with the President Sarkozy's chief advisor uh, on Africa. And he had nearly the identical view that we need now is the moment to work for peace in Darfur. I've spent time in the, here in this town with the Chinese ambassador to the United Nations recently, same thing met a number of Arab League representatives, same thing. We have an opportunity here, folks, to, to move the ball forward, even with all of the divisions and all the debates on Sudan and all the issues that have marked uh, a very divisive uh, last few years on Darfur. We can, I think, resolve, help to bring a resolution to the crisis there. Um, to that end, I think the President of our country here in the United States needs to put a put the resources to bring the resources to bear for that. We, I had the opportunity to spend a great deal of time between 2000, uh, while I was still working for the last, the previous President Clinton, and then in helping some of uh, the the um, uh, emissaries, the diplomats, in uh, in the peace process that followed uh, the uh, end of the Clinton administration, that followed for the North-South peace deal. And that carefully constructed process, which had been years in the making, which had the leadership of a, Afri a Kenyan general, uh, Lazaro Simbewo, backed very closely by the United States, Britain, uh, Norway, and a number of other countries from the region uh, in Africa and, and the surrounding uh, 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 and across the Red Sea brought what most people at the time thought, and at the time it was the deadliest war in the world, two million people, estimates, I'm sure Professor Mamadani would probably <laughs> have a dispute with that number, but those, those were the highest mortality figures after Congo of anywhere in the world since the Holocaust. Um, and most people thought, yeah, there's no way you're gonna get these guys to agree to anything. And a very concerted diplomatic effort, led by the African mediator, but closely supported by the United States and a number of other countries around the world, brought pressure to bear on the parties, the rebels in the South, the government in Khartoum, and brought and offered incentives as well to uh, a, a peaceful resolution. And they managed to come up with a very complicated but uh, uh, very successful peace deal. Uh, the same can be done now for Darfur, uh, uh, it, is, it is there to be picked, it is ripe, um, as Professor Zartman would say. 
uh, for you SEPA fans of that kind of uh, ideology. We need, I think, to present the Sudanese government with uh, a door one and a door two and do the same with the rebels. Uh, very simply, door one, if the government restores aid access, allows for assistance to, to flow to the people who are in so desperately in need of that assistance and address the leadership crisis uh, and work for peace, then there should be a clear path to normalization with the United States and other countries that have had significant and serious bilateral problems with the Sudanese regime, given all of the human rights abuses it's been um, accused of. Door two, on the other hand, if they continue to use starvation and thirst and disease as weapons of war, if Bashir remains defiant, if there's no progress towards peace <clears throat> in Darfur, and if there's an upsetting of the apple cart in the peace process, in the implementation of the, of the uh, North-South peace deal, then we need to prepare for diplomatic, economic, and as a last resort, let me be very, very clear about this, and hopefully we'll have time to debate and discuss what we mean when we talk about the possible use of military force and for what purposes. A very, very last resort, then there ought to be planning at least, just as there ought to have been planning in 1993 and early 1994 in preparation for what ended up happening in Rwanda, which we were totally unprepared for and uninterested in after our Blackhawks were shot down in Somalia. So it would be criminally irresponsible for us not to prepare for scenarios in which thousands and thousands of people starve if assistance is cut off for extended periods of time, which I do not think the Sudanese government will do, however you plan for those eventualities. Remember, the policy status quo in Sudan has led to what I believe to be and that is certainly a word, I don't think it, I believe it to be, and what's a very different concept, uh, two and a quarter to two and a half million lives lost during this 20 to 25 year period of warfare in southern Sudan and in Darfur. Those are the, all the mortality estimates thrown together, and maybe it's stupid, frankly, to talk about the numbers of people dying, because we don't really know. Having spent most of my adult life working in war zones in Africa, I can tell you most of these figures are wild estimates. I mean, they're, they're simply crazily wild estimates. Occasionally you get credible mortality data, but it's usually very localized. So people then extrapolate beyond that local area, then they multiply by this area, and then they figure out, well, this area had this level of death, crude, death morta crude mortality rates six months ago, so let's add that together. And at the end of the day, it's not really credible. We don't know if it's 150, 250, 400,000, 500,000 people who have died in Darfur. And frankly, it, it's not something that we're ever going to know. The evidence of all of these crimes will have been washed away in the sands of the Sahara long after we can begin the picking apart of all of the questions about estimates. But I do know that the number of de dead and the number of disease and the number of people who will suffer enormously uh, will increase exponentially if we do not act boldly, diplomatically, to try to help bring peace to Darfur. How much time? Five minutes. Okay. So I give you in five minutes what I think are five windows of opportunity. Why it is this moment that peace is possible in Sudan amidst all of the dreariness and all the negativity and all the pessimism about the direction that country is going. Here's why I think with real concerted diplomatic work, the United States and other countries that care working with uh, Sudanese can bring about a change. First window is something we haven't talked much about yet, but will, I'm sure at some point, the uh, war crimes indictment of the International Criminal Court. <clears throat> this has been highly destabilizing internally to the ruling party in uh, the National Congress Party inside Khartoum. And it provides a tremendous new source of influence uh, for the international community to leverage peace uh, in Sudan in exchange for the elusive Article 16, the ability to suspend these cases 
uh, defer these cases in the interest of international peace, which is part and parcel of the International Criminal Court's mandate uh, and charter. Second window of opportunity, I think, concerns China. China, as many of you know, has invested, we estimate, eight and a half billion dollars in the oil sector in Sudan. Now, I just, in my last two visits to southern Sudan, not Darfur, but southern Sudan, I've spent a lot of time with the former rebels there who have trying to become the government there in southern Sudan. And every one of them said, if we go back to war, and the if is a big one, that the possibilities are very, very high at this point. If we go back to war, if the referendum does not occur, our first target is going to be the Chinese oil installation. So I came back to the New York, came back here and talked to the Chinese ambassador. He was horrified because their interlocutor is only the ruling party in Khartoum who will never tell them that their assets are at risk because of instability. So they have a vested interest in peace and stability. Why is the United States not working hand in hand closely with China for very different reasons to bring about the same objective that we would like to see happen in Sudan, which is peace? <laughs> the third window of opportunity is the election that's going to occur at the beginning of 2010. Now with elections, of course this isn't going to be a free and fair election. No one's going to put this one up in the poster of of, uh, of, of successful African elections during the last decade. But all kinds of political alliances are possible. And the incumbent president, by the way, is going to be, as he runs, if he runs, if he lasts that long, an indicted war criminal. Uh, and that will have consequences that are very, very unpredictable. It's a major opportunity if we play, uh, if we uh, undertake uh, creative diplomacy, working with some of the regional actors who are fed up with Bashir for many reasons not only how he treats his own population, but his support for Hamas and other kinds of things that have an impact in the Arab League. The fourth window of opportunity is the new president in Washington. This is one that I think rebounds in a lot of places around the world, and it's a complete unknown, and it may not last very long, but because he's new, because of who he is, because of the interest uh, that he has demonstrated on these issues, because he's traveled there, because he said, his uh, uh, Khartoum embassy person said he may actually travel to Sudan later this year. Um, for all these reasons, Obama becomes a wild card in all of this if he engages and his administration engages quite substantially. Just like Bush was the wild card in southern Sudan because of the uh, conservative Christian uh, 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 lobbies that uh, generated and fueled his interest and enthusiasm in trying to do something positive in southern Sudan. Similarly, you have a president now who is willing uh, to engage and, is, and, and wants to help bring about a solution. That's quite a substantial uh, 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 opportunity, window of opportunity. Fifth and final window uh, is a strange one. It's you, frankly. You know, for the first time since the word genocide was invented uh, after World War II, we are seeing the formation of a mass movement of people uh, all across the United States to help stop these atrocities. Um, now, of course, I will not quibble with, with Professor Mamdani. It is a different situation than it was at the outset of the Darfur War in 2003, 2004, when there was active village burnings and the counterinsurgency was, was the deadliest in, in the world. But having people, and that's why I started my whole uh, uh, intervention this, this evening with a description of what life is like for somebody in, the, in a camp. And that person, most of those people that ended up in those camps were driven out of their homes, out of their villages, by that counterinsurgency campaign of the government of Sudan. So we can quibble, quibble all day of whether it's better or worse or how many people died or how many people haven't died. But it is unacceptable people have to live like this. And now to have the aid tap turned off as a systematic way of punishing collectively people who have the gall to rebel because of historic marginalization. So I think very, very much that the fifth and final window of opportunity are people like yourselves who are willing to show up, who are willing to care, who actually, most of you I imagine, are probably motivated in some way, shape, or form by a desire to see the suffering of these people end one way or another, however it happens. And I think that 
that sentiment has translated, and I can tell you it's translated directly to President Obama because he told me. He said one of the main reasons why his administration is going to be able to act with all of the other things that are going on in the world is because there is this lobby. There is this constituency of people who care about what is happening. That is significant and that is a huge window of opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Mamdan, the way forward. I come from uh, Uganda. Um, I was amongst those expelled in 72 by DME because I come from uh, uh, ancestrally from India. I went back in 79 when Amin was expelled. And uh, I used to hear figures of how many died in Uganda under the Amin regime. One million dead. I went around to, around the country. I was there from 79 to 1996 long period, and I concluded that these figures couldn't be believed. Darfur confirmed my suspicions. When I listened to John talk about, with total confidence, two million died in South Sudan, two and a half million in South Sudan and Darfur, and then almost in a cavalier way, we will never know which figures are true. They may be true, they may not be true. The only explanation I have is the following. The estimates of the dead are usually done by agencies whose funding depends on how many have died, or are about to die, or are at risk. When they are inflating the numbers of the dead or those at risk, they are writing a funding application. We should take it as such. The US government has not spoken with one voice. Actually, there's been a division between Congress and the State Department. Colin Powell was in Darfur. He was on his way out at Khartoum Airport. He was interviewed by the media. There's an NPR report. I quote it in my book. Paul was asked time and again, is there a genocide in Darfur? And Paul said every time, no. My lawyers have told me, no, there is no genocide in Darfur. On his way, Paul found out otherwise from his boss. In his career as Secretary of State, Paul had two times bent to the pressure of the force brought on him, but not the force of the evidence before him. Bush's special envoy to Darfur, Andrew Natsios, read his testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee a couple of years ago, and he is adamant. He's adamant, he's questioned about the rape, and he says that rape takes place wherever armed young men confront unarmed women whether it's in the rebel camps, whether it's in government control camps in Darfur, whether it's in Sierra Leone, whether it's in Congo, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in Afghanistan, or whether it's in the United States. It's a larger problem, and it needs to be addressed as such. I'll come to the question of military force as the last resort. Uh, I'm shocked to hear that. If they don't do what we ask them to do, then military force, right? That's what we're being told. Okay, so let's take the, there are two alternatives before us on what to do. One alternative is summed up in the, the ICC case, the International Criminal Court. Um, now, a couple of things about the ICC, the prosecutor, that genocide was unfolding. So that's not at issue. But the court did upheld, uphold its claim that a crime against humanity had taken place in Darfur. That is, that if the facts as stated in the application of the prosecutor are true, if the facts are true, then there is a case to answer. 
So on that basis, the court issued a summons. The facts are not yet on trial. This was a pre-trial hearing. If there is a trial, the facts will be on trial. What I have said in my previous, nobody knows. Holmes further says, 200,000 died from combined causes. It doesn't tell us what the combined causes are, but presumably drought and desertification <coughs> is one of them. And then Holmes says that if the rate of death remained the same, then 300,000 must have died. But it didn't remain the same. It, in fact, declined dramatically. So that's the first thing that any trial would have to question. Second thing the trial would have to question is the causes of death, 79 to 1996, long period. And I concluded that these figures could not be believed, uh, uh, that, that force must be a last, last resort. Um, Thus my alarm at, at hearing all the talk about continuing genocide, uh, because all this talk feeds into the rhetoric of those who look for a military solution. More troops, no fly zones, and, and, and those who seem to have no interest whatsoever when the chips are down in a political solution. Now I recognize that John spent a good bit of time talking about the possibility of a political solution, and I think that that is an admirable adjustment to the new situation today. It is clear that in the period after the international NGOs were kicked out of Sudan, <clears throat> those small number of NGOs who were kicked out of Sudan, it is clear that the initial demand from the Save Darfur movement, etc., was for a heavy direct response. But it's clear that the US administration has been backtracking. And this is, I think, a necessary and an admirable adjustment to an understanding of realities on the ground. As I said before, there has been a difference between the State Department and Congress. Congress has been driven by the Save Darfur activists themselves. The State Department has been a little more realistic about this, and one can only hope that there will be two changes. One that the presidency will not respond to the bellicose uh, uh, nature of the movement organized around Save Darfur. And two, one can hope that the movement organized around Darfur will become more informed, less bellicose, and more political in its aspirations. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. so. Um now for, uh, for each of our speakers, there will be an opportunity to, to rebut and to state some conclusions, and then we'll go to questions. So, John? Thanks, Peter. Um, first, a, a note about uh, the objectives of the, uh, if we can just, I, I know you're shorthanding when you say save Darfur, is it sort of a, the, the, the mishmash of activists all over the country <laughs> are pressing for this. For quite some time now, the, uh, activists have been focused very, very uh, exclusively on uh, what I've been trying to articulate, which is uh, a much more effective uh, political response from the previous administration and now the new one. Uh, peace is the objective of the uh, peace agreement in Darfur and implementation of this comprehensive peace agreement in the North-South deal is the objective of the Save Darfur Coalition and a number of the other organizations that are associated with it or work in tandem with it. That's what they do, that's what they're for, and any other, frankly, and let me tell you this very, very clearly, any other representation of their position or our position is a distortion of that position. Secondly, the mortality figures. Um, uh, let's see where we agree. We agree the figures have declined. Uh, the, the level of mortality uh, has declined since the height, as we said, of 2003 and 4. Uh, the preponderance of the those that have perished have died, as as in any war, uh, in uh, conflict-related causes, disease, uh, malnutrition, and and thirst in the Sahara, not by gunshot or machete or helicopter gunship. Um, so you know, I don't know where the dispute is, frankly. And then thirdly, um, what, why I say we don't know, 
and why I would then say this next sentence would be, it's vastly undercounted, is because there are huge swaths of territory, just as in southern Sudan and why the death count was so high in the south, there are huge swaths of territory during the last six years that have been rendered inaccessible to aid agencies, either because the government of Sudan has made them no-go areas or because of insecurity. So we simply have no idea what is going on with respect to mortality in some of these areas that are inaccessible. Now, these are displaced people as well. These are people who have had their way of life and way of living disrupted massively over the last few years. The economy of Darfur, frankly, is never talked about, but is in a depression because the, the interrelationship, the intercommunal kinship relationships that had been established over generations have been destroyed by this divide and destroy policy of the government. So most people are in dire straits, and so when you have uh, months and sometimes years of, of inaccessibility to aid, uh, uh, to assistance, we can only guess. And I can't do better than that, frankly, and I'm trying to be honest with you. I think the numbers that are thrown around are just guesstimates. They are not even estimates. Third point I would like to make in response is, is this point about rape. I, I couldn't let that go. I mean, rape is a tool of war in Darfur, and you have to spend time there to understand how intrinsic it is to the effort by the government of Sudan to destroy uh, these communities. Uh, you have to sit and talk to women all day long who tell you and then show you the marks as they've been branded. I mean, this isn't fabrication. This is not New York City. There is sexual violence everywhere in some way, shape, or form, yes, but this is a systematic approach as a method and tool of conflict, a method and tool of submission and subjugation. Hugely important issue for the people of Darfur, maybe not so convenient here. Fourth, let's clarify the use of military force. I can tell you that no credible person in the activist community that anyone takes seriously has called for a military occupation of Darfur. No one has talked about that. There are two positions that have been credibly put forward, and this is where we are. Anything else is a distortion, so I'll tell you what they are now. First and foremost, rooted in international law, the United Nations Security Council has three times censored the government of Sudan for using offensive military flights against civilian targets. China and Russia voted for these resolutions. So it wasn't a U.S. Western plot. <laughs> this was what the world believes is happening in Darfur. And three times the United Nations Security Council, not the Save Darfur movement, said they put forward resolutions that banned offensive military flights by the government of Sudan. Now we all know that most cases the United Nations Security Council is a feckless institution operationally, but they put forth their best effort at saying what the world thinks, and they tried to condemn this use, this tool of terrorism against civilian population, which is aerial bombardment, a critical, by the way, advantage that the government of Sudan has over the rebels in Darfur. It is the reason why they've won, they've been winning the war. It's because of air superiority, unchallenged air superiority. So when we talk about use of force, first and foremost, it is an enforcement of the ban that the United Nations Security Council has already voted three times, so understand that, okay? And then secondly, what has been talked about more recently as a last resort, please follow it, is if there is a sustained and systematic obstruction of humanitarian assistance, I said if, in Darfur, and if the mortality rates skyrocket, if we start to see the kind of images we've seen in so many African wars, where people are systematically denied assistance on the basis of either political or affiliation or their identity, and if we are unprepared to do anything about that, I would find that rather negligible. So I, negligent. So I would hope that we would be undertaking scenario planning to see what possibilities exist for the deployment of sufficient assets to deliver humanitarian assistance should we come to that point. Those are the two, I think, 
approaches that activists have put forward as possible uses of military force. There is no other. Next point is this question of genocide in the ICC, which was also distorted. The, just, the judges did not throw out this prosecutor's charge of genocide uh, that he tried to uh, have brought to the case. There are three judges that consider the evidence that the prosecutor brings. One judge said, I agree. It's genocide. There's enough evidence. I vote for it. Did you know that? So two, the other two judges said, wait a minute. There isn't enough evidence on, the, on in, the issue of intent. This is the interesting thing about the definition of genocide. The perpetrator, if it's to be considered genocide in international law, and it's a very, very disputed issue as we've seen tonight and as everyone in this room knows, for genocide to occur, the perpetrator has to intend to destroy. It can't just be a byproduct of one's counterinsurgency operation. So two of them of the three, one said, yes, it's genocide. Two of them said, we don't have enough evidence of intent. We're going to keep the case open, keep providing us evidence, and we will rule on this later. They didn't throw it out. Fifth is the issue of justice. Now, I think conscientious people can disagree about this question, and I think we can put forward a number of different cases all over the continent, around the world, where at times transitional justice, at times uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions and those kinds of things are the best way forward, and at other times the uh, uh, justice in the courtroom is required. And I think at this juncture, uh, to end this cycle of impunity that has fueled and driven conflict, destructive conflict in Sudan since uh, the uh, uh, independence of that country, I think it requires some measure of accountability in a court. And I think that Bashir's case is more akin to Milosevic and Charles Taylor than it is to de Klerk from South Africa. And that was where I would come down. But I do respect very, very fully that, and I think was quite brilliant on the part of the architects of the International Criminal Court, as they put, for, put together the, the, uh, the charter of that institution, which allows for the deferral of a case on the basis or in the interests of international peace. So if indeed there was peace in Darfur, if this president in Khartoum signed a peace deal with Darfur and implemented a peace deal in the South, I would be the first person in line to be arguing for an Article 16 deferral because that's what the Charter of the International Criminal Court intended. Thanks. Please. Well, the fact is the judges of the ICC threw out the charge of genocide two to one. That's the truth. <laughs> um, in conflicts, there are deaths directly from the conflict, and there are conflict-related deaths. And usually conflict-related deaths are more. So how do you tell which of the deaths from other causes are or are not conflict-related? It's very difficult. Except in this case, the death from drought and desertification begins before the conflict. Because the conflict begins 87, 89. Then it stops. And the conflict we're talking about, the phase of the conflict, is 2003, 2004. The drought and desertification and the deaths from it are already intense by the mid-80s. When you think about the international uh, NGOs, uh, keep one thing in mind. The international NGOs are no longer your humble community level effort. The largest of the international NGO has an annual budget of over $2 billion. Billion, 
not million. Right? That's larger than the annual budget of most African countries. Right? So these are powerful organizations. The conflict between international NGOs and the African governments has been over who is sovereign. The international NGOs demand that African governments do not monitor them, do not supervise them, let them do anything they want to do. Why? Because they claim to be doing it in the interest of victims. African governments, governments in general, claim to be speaking not for victims, but for citizens. And I will develop this question of the difference between citizen and victim in a minute. <clears throat> but first to the Save Darfur movement. Save Darfur began as a, an alliance of religious movements. If you went to the rally, the first big rally in New York City, uh, they passed out faith packets at the rally. Christian faith packets, Jewish faith packets, Muslim faith packets. The Christian faith packet told you that the Lord had empowered Christians to lead humanity. The Jewish faith packet told its reader that the Lord had made Jews particularly sensitive to sensing genocide when it occurs. And the Muslim faith packet said that Muslims were particularly well-placed to identify perpetrators of genocide. Right? So you can already tell right at the beginning the point of view of this body which came together. Now, there wasn't a single point of view. There were multiple points of views. There was, and I say this in my book, there were some of those who had historically been linked to the movement, to solidarity with the rebel movement in South Sudan, and who assumed that Darfur was just another version of South Sudan, but Darfur wasn't. The South Sudan insurgency began from the very outset as an insurgency against the government. In Darfur, the conflict began as a civil war. In South Sudan, the government tried to turn it into a civil war. There was a big difference. That is why in Darfur, you don't have one movement, you don't have a John Garang, but you have incredibly fractionalized movements. The international NGOs in Darfur have assumed that to be an Arab in Darfur is to be a perpetrator. I, last week, I was speaking in Tufts, at Tufts University, at an <clears throat> institute uh, where, whose researchers work in northern Darfur, and I asked them, can you figure out why they decided to dismiss these, to throw out these international NGOs and not others? They said, yes, because these are the ones who never employ an Arab Darfuri. These are the ones who will not let an Arab Darfuri into their camp. These are the ones who see their camps as basically camps for victims who they see as non-Arab only. From the point of view of the government, they have exacerbated the conflict rather than solved it. Now, I want to say something about Save Darfur movement itself. I said it was remarkably successful, and it was patterned initially after the peace movement of the 1960s, except that Save Darfur is not a peace movement. Save Darfur is a war mobilization. Listen to the slogans. Boots on the ground. Out of Iraq, into Darfur. Those are not slogans of a peace movement. I went, when I went to Darfur, 2008, I said to the UN humanitarian officer, I said, Save Darfur gathered $15 million from contributions last year. How much did it send to Darfur? He said, nothing. I said, nothing. I came back here, I asked a Save Darfur person that I was told, you sent nothing? He said, yes. We are not an aid agency, we are an advocacy group. Save Darfur employs an advertising agency 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is a lavish advertisement, putting out the figures that you read, none of which are credible. It has a contempt for facts which parallels those who are so intoxicated with power, in the words of Senator Fulbright at the time of the Vietnam War, it is symptomatic of the arrogance of power. The facts that this movement gives out are com 
completely decontextualized. Go to a Save Darfur site, website. What you will find on this website is a, 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 a documentation of atrocities. No history, no politics, nothing tells you why there is violence. All you see is evidence of killing, raping, ethnic cleansing. I call it a pornography of violence, a form of voyeurism. It is meant for the good of the one who views it, not for the good of the one who is being viewed. The focus is on naming and shaming, on punishment, on criminal justice. The demand is not reform, the demand is punishment, as if they are lusting for blood. It is, I believe, seamlessly a part of the war on terror, because the underlying assumption is if the problem is violence, the solution is more violence. And yet, the amazing thing is that the Save Darfur mobilization, precisely when its propaganda was com more and more divorced from the facts on the ground, its mobilization was more and more successful. And I want to say this to you and to others who have seen this mobilization, because there is reason for concern. There is a big contrast between the peace movement of the 60s and the Save Darfur movement today. The peace movement of the 60s turned the world into a classroom. Its signature activity was the teach-in. Save Darfur has turned the world into an advertising medium. It relates to its constituency not as an educator, but as an advertiser. It has not created or even tried to create an informed movement, but a feel-good constituency. Its focus you can see is increasingly shifting from college students to high school kids. These are Save Darfur's version of child soldiers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> its, its leaders, that's two minutes left. Its leaders are less educators. They are more celebrities from high profile activities, showbiz and sports. They openly disdain education and debate. They court the CNN effect. My puzzle was, when I was trying to study this movement in 2006, 2007, and I knew there were American soldiers in Iraq, and I knew the atrocities in Iraq were much worse, my puzzle was, why were my students and my son's classmates, why were they being mobilized around Darfur and not around Iraq? And I realized that Iraq calls on Americans to respond as citizens. A student who thinks of Iraq realizes either he feels or she feels guilty or he or she feels impotent, that there are limits to American power. When it comes to Darfur, these same students do not relate to Darfur as citizens. They relate to Darfur as humans. And they do not relate to Darfuris as citizens but as victims. When I first came to the US, which was as a student in 1963, I remember being so surprised to being in a, because I was in a place where people were so generous, they gave so freely to charities, and yet these same people were so stingy when it came to paying tax. I realized that the very people who were paying millions to charities would spend millions to hire lawyers so they didn't have to pay more tax. I realized that Darfur is a charity. Iraq is a tax. In Darfur, these same students can feel what they know they are not in Iraq, powerful saviors. In Darfur, the assumption is, as throughout the world, witness John's words, that if they don't make it right, we must go and make it right. The assumption is that the problem is internal, the solution is external. The US has to learn to live in the world, not to occupy it. Thank you. So we'll be moving on to questions. And I have, um, as people would like to line up to give questions, why don't you get ready? I'm going to ask, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and, and pose my own to start. But I would ask, when you give, when you ask your question, identify yourself, make the questions short. And I'd like to ask the audience not to applaud either during the questions, either from the, to the questioner or to the respondent. But um, my own questions, John first and, and, and then to Mahmoud. I, mobilization is a scary thing and always leads to excess. Whenever any movement is taken on an issue that I know well, it scares the daylights out of me. 
And, and in listening to you carefully, I actually think you're scared. And I wonder if you might comment, because I, I hear in what you're saying that you have a big concern that we're not talking about, which is the end of the comprehensive peace accord in Sudan and the, the possibility of the North and South going back to war. And however we quibble about those numbers, the one thing we do know is a lot more people died in the conflict with Southern Sudan and the horror that uh, we might be facing if we see that war start up again will dwarf anything perhaps that we've seen in Darfur. And I actually hear that you sort of inserted that in a very quiet sort of hidden way almost in your comments. And, and if I were you, I would be scared because the mobilized community around Darfur actually doesn't know the first thing about the comprehensive peace agreement. You've said that, you're, that, the, that, the, that the advocacy position is peace in Sudan, but, but that's not what the people know. I don't think. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I really don't think so. I think, actually, you and I are pretty old, and that the stories of southern Sudan have been largely forgotten in a very strange way, and that something horrible is out there, and, and that's the big story, and the Save Darfur mobilization may not be what's going to get us there, and neither the indictment. And I, and I was intrigued by and pleased to hear your discussion of the possibility of a compromise or of a Security Council intervention in Sudan on the, on the, on the um, indictment. It would be interesting to know what conditions you think are necessary for that to happen. Mahmoud, my question to you, I, I've, I've asked this, I suppose, in different ways. As a, as a practitioner in human rights, the one thing that I know are, are that there are unexpected consequences all over the place. And, and on every major position I've taken on international justice, I've been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the Pinochet indictment caused me the heebie-jeebies. It was really upsetting to see Spain, a country that had never faced its past, indict the leader of a country, Chile, uh, a former leader in, in Chile under circumstances that seemed to be divorced from the reality in Chile. And yet the effect has been amazingly positive and, and for reasons entirely beyond our anticipation, that the arrest in London helped us set back in motion the, uh, the, 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 the legal process in Chile in a way that made people able to get beyond Pinochet in ways that was completely unpredictable. The arrest of Charles Taylor, the indictment of Charles Taylor, from a legal point of view, absurd. It wasn't within the mandate. There was no right for, a, for this mixed tribunal to indict Charles Taylor. It was an insult to Ghana, the context in which it took place. And yet, it worked. That's, only, that's the only thing I can say at the end of the day, is that it worked. Now, we know that the circumstances are very different in Sudan. But, but what would make you step back and say, gosh, I couldn't have imagined it, but it worked. It set something in motion. What would that look like? I think, um, you know, in 2003 and 2004, um, no one knew what a Darfur was. And uh, there was a concerted effort by uh, people uh, all over this country who did know uh, to teach others. Um, and there was this wonderful uh, new development call, you know, that allowed for mobilization virally, uh, which, you know, 10, 15 years ago, with peace movements or these kinds of things, we wouldn't have been able to get to remotely the number of people that have learned about Darfur through internet-based, social uh, marketing-based sources. So um, I think that that means that the problem that you're outlining that people don't know about southern Sudan is, a, is not as formidable as it would have been 10 or 15 years ago because part of what we've tried to do over the last year as we've tried to assert a little more uh, put a little more adult supervision into this, into this, uh, into this movement, is in addition to pressing for a clear uh, uh, objective of peace in Sudan as the fundamental objective, not the other things you're hearing. Uh, secondly, that there is a important, the importance, the overriding importance of an all Sudan solution. That indeed, uh, North far north is vulnerable to a potential conflict. The east has seen conflict and will see it again if their issues are unaddressed uh, on the borders of Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, the south sadly will rise again uh, if we do not see the implementation fully of this 
north-south deal and and Darfur. So I think there is there is a great deal of education going on now about a, more of an all Sudan solution. I do want to say one thing, and you can flash me the the the, the minute card as as soon as you want about this question of Save Darfur. I don't work for the Save Darfur Coalition, but I do want to say that it is, uh, it is an advocacy group. It doesn't pretend to be a humanitarian group and then collect money and then only do advocacy. Advocacy, Washington DC, New York City, full of groups that are advocacy groups, that's what they do. They're trying to change United States government or UN policy, that's what their objective is. Um, its primary focus, and I need to reiterate this over and over again, please get on the website as Professor Mamdani has challenged you to do, you will find, in fact, that the objective of the organization is indeed uh, peace for Sudan. Uh, it also lobbies for humanitarian assistance. So taking that little piddling amounts of few million dollars that it can raise and hopefully translating that into tens of millions and hundreds of millions, sadly, which are necessary to keep people alive in the current construct in Darfur, their budget is not remotely close to $15 million now. You can look it up. And I'm sure um, if you Google uh, the phalanx of actors, just Google George Clooney and his army of high school soldiers, you'll find that pretty consistently the message is uh, in favor and in support of U.S. engagement for peace in Sudan. That is what the Darfur movement is about. Uh, not military occupation of Sudan. Well, I am glad you recognize the necessity for adult supervision <laughs> of the child soldiers of this movement. Um, well, uh, to the chair's uh, question. Um, look, uh, I don't deny at all that the uh, uh, Pinochet, Fujimori, Charles Taylor is a bit more complicated. These cases were salutary. Um, but my suggestion would be to recognize that there's a difference between criminal justice in cases where the conflict has ended and prioritizing criminal justice in ongoing conflicts. That is the first big difference uh, between Darfur um, and, and uh, either Chile or Peru or any of these cases. Um, in fact, if we look at other cases in Latin America, um, wherever the military handed over power in most cases where the military handed over power to civilian governments, part of the deal was that the military will not be put on trial. You will not be put on trial, hand over power. Even if you look at the de-Sovietization experience in Eastern Europe, look at East Germany. East Germany where the new government publicly pledged that it will make public the names of informers in Stasi and it opened the books and started making these names public and then realized the names were so many that if they made them all public, it risked starting a civil war and it stopped the exercise. Think of Spain after the civil war. Decades of amnesia. It's debatable and it is debated. But what I'm saying is, what I'm, is that this is nothing new. This is nothing new. When a conflict is ongoing and you're faced with the challenge of how do you stop it and how do you make the peace durable, what kind of political reform is necessary, then you prioritize political reform over criminal justice. You prioritize the welfare of living individuals over punishing, indiv living groups over punishing individual perpetrators. Um, let me just say one last thing, which is, Look, um, the Save Darfur example shows that the Save Darfur movement had a salutary effect at the beginning. It did publicize this violence. But having done it, it simply went on its own merry course, uh, 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 uninterested in what was happening in Darfur, completely uninterested, uninterested in the opportunities of peace, simply wanting to build a movement in the United States. Um, the ICC case itself also, as a threat, 
can have a salutary effect in terms of promoting reform. But if that threat, threat is delivered, <clears throat> the unintended consequences will be terrible, including the, 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 uh, uh, <clears throat> the agreement in the South coming unhinged. Thank you. Thanks. So no applause during the questions. <laughs> Excellent. Good start. Let's start with the questions here. Identify yourself and, uh, and ask your question. Hi, I'm Hiba Hop. Well, really project. Um, okay. My name is Hiba Hop. I'm a student at the law school. No, you, you have to stand in front of it. Yeah, but it still yeah, doesn't it's record. Not working. It's not working. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's working. I'll just hold it. Okay. Um, it seemed to some extent in the rebuttals that you were responding to each other substantively, but not really conceptually. And it seemed like, it felt, at least for me, like watching a debate between Locke or, you know, Madison and Foucault, where on the one hand, you're concentrating on individual I saw rights. that debate, by the way. <laughs> Madison and Foucault debates. Enlighten us. <laughs> uh, who won? Yeah. Um, and Professor Mogdani, you're focusing on institutions of violence in history. Um, and so I guess I, I wanted to ask each of you a question to try to maybe, you know, really work out the, the, the difficulties of consolidating these positions. And Professor Mogdani, I guess my question to you is, what do we do about the people in the camps? And, and for you, um, Mr. Prendergast, how do you reinterpret your confidence in international law, the UN, and Western intervention uh, in light of Professor Mamdani's critiques? Great question. Um, let's begin with the recognition that in Every case that I know over the last few decades in Africa um, where either as a result of famine or war uh, you had a huge number of IDPs in camps. In every one of these cases there was a confrontation between the international NGOs and the government of the day. In Ethiopia, in Rwanda when it came to the IDPs in uh, Eastern Congo, and now in Darfur. And the question was about who is sovereign. Will the international NGOs operate under government monitoring, under the monitoring of the sovereign, or will they not operate under this monitoring? The challenge for the governing power is, of course, enormous. Um, you know, when I was uh, in, in uh, in Darfur in these meetings, and I remember in the meeting with the IDPs, I was so shocked um, that they totally believed uh, uh, the, the, the Save Darfur messages, that they completely believed that their salvation lay in uh, UN soldiers rather than African Union soldiers. When we told them that when the UN comes in, the soldiers will still be African, only the command will be in New York City. They couldn't believe it. They kept on saying, no, we want white soldiers. We want white soldiers. We want white soldiers. Um, the problem is that the IDPs have gradually made, have been made into what they were said to be at the beginning, which is victims, uh, which is wards, which is objects of charity. How do you, what kind of transition is necessary to move from that to citizenship? And that transition is more than simply providing for the food that they need or the medicine that they need. That, I think, will be the easier part of the transition. But the crucial question is, and I'm not going to lay out a blueprint here, I can't lay out a blueprint. The crucial question is, if citizenship is to be part of that transition, it has to be an internal process. Now, one final thing. If, if an external intervention, let's imagine a situation where <clears throat> the, an external intervention is absolutely necessary, where should it come from? My view is that 
in such a case, the external intervention has to be regional. It cannot be by the big powers. The intervention must be by those who are your peers, who can imagine themselves in your shoes, and it must be by those who are your neighbors who will have to face the consequences of the intervention, not by distant big powers who have the luxury to leave, as they have from Afghanistan time and again, and to let us suffer the consequences. The Save Darfur notion and the international NGO notion is simply one in a line of recipes we have received since independence, starting with structural adjustment program. You come, you give a blueprint, whatever the consequences, you don't have to face them. They have to be faced by the people on the ground. I am not talking of an intervention by individual countries like Uganda and Rwanda and Congo or Ethiopia in Somalia who become proxies of some big power. I'm talking of an intervention through a regional mechanism with some possibility of accountability. Thank you. So um, I think the best case scenario uh, over, the, over the next decade would be if we start to see some of the those that have been indicted by the International Criminal Court uh, from the Congo, for example, the warlords from Maturi uh, begin to be convicted for uh, recruiting child soldiers and some of the other war crimes that they have been charged with in the uh, ICC, um, that uh, Joseph Kony and the other leaders of the Lord's Resistance Army uh, would be um, captured and apprehended and, and brought to justice in the Hague for the uh, crimes that they've committed uh, throughout the last 20 years, Africa's longest war, that um, Bashir ends up um, being convicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity, including, in the words of the, of the court, the same judges who threw out, threw out genocide two to one, extermination and rape, um, that he uh, faced justice in that way and then we have against the backdrop, those cases against the backdrop of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the new court in Cambodia. And slowly, and the Pinochet case and others, and slowly but surely, there begins to develop, best case scenario, a deterrent to war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, uh, over the coming uh, decade. Um, and that governments and rebel groups have to think twice. John, let me just interrupt, because I, I think I, I'm worried that you're, I, maybe to just push you a little bit in the, from my, so that my elegant student's question gets answered. If, you take, if, if, I, if I take seriously some of the things that Mahmoud is saying, I fear the opposite in each of the cases that you've just mentioned. I fear that the ICC is becoming discredited and so its legitimacy will never build because, and I, would, and I would go further, and I would say, because actually they're in trouble in the Congo, because they're in trouble in Uganda, and now in the way they've moved into Sudan, they're in trouble further. And even if you believe what you believe, even if, even if you believe that the views of, of Professor Mamdani are, 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 are ill-founded, can you consider the possibility that actually the court's legitimacy itself in Africa is now being undermine it, it's being viewed as an imperial entity, and that that's going to undermine the possibilities of the court's effect. Two, two separate things, don't pile on. Uh, first, uh, there is uh, uh, a similar uh, pattern uh, that one has to uh, definitely acknowledge that in the case, for example, of uh, Charles Taylor, when the special court for Sierra Leone um, issued its indictment for him and he laughed as Bashir is laughing now, and people said, my God, doesn't this diminish the credibility of this little court here as it tries to figure out what it's going to do? And 18 months later, he's in the dock in The Hague. Let's see. Okay. And when Milosevic was, and you just, uh, person who's graced these halls here, uh, talked to Richard Holbrook about um, Milosevic's first reactions to his, um, to his indictment by the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, very similar to... Uh, in its dismissal to um, to Bashir, um, and we have the same, you know, very very difficult startup periods for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was I just remember years of 
corruption and and uh, overspending and all kinds of things that just made you de just demoralized the, the the proponents of justice and sadly this is when you create international and multilateral institutions they tend to work fairly badly uh, early on and and hopefully with good leadership can uh, the, the ship can be righted and we can see some successes and I think it's going to be uneven I don't think it's going to be uh, a slam, I don't think it's going to be complete success or complete failure. I think we're going to stumble along for a while in the, in the universal gray area where some of the cases in Congo, for example, finally come to court this, uh, this fall and we start to see some convictions. And maybe Kony gets apprehended or maybe he doesn't. Maybe one of the Sudanese gets caught, maybe he doesn't. We'll see more people convicted uh, in Rwanda. We'll see more uh, we'll see some startup in Cambodia, and this will stumble along. And my hope is, and I'm, tr I'm really trying to answer the question, uh, my hope <laughs> is that, that over time, that over time, when with a, with a backdrop of more success stories rather than those early moments where it looks pretty bleak, as it has for the first five years of the ICC, which does not have a conviction yet, um, that five years from now when there are, and 10 years from now, when it's a more credible institution, we will hope, then we might be a different story. We might be having a different conversation. That's my hope. It's not my belief. That's my hope. And I think most of us activists are sustained by hope more than anything else in our careers. All right. Well, we have a, we have a lot of people who have been patiently waiting. So let's, uh, let's hear. And just introduce yourself quickly. And uh, Good evening. My name is Zaina Viega. I'm from uh, Southern Sudan. I live here in New York. And if I may, may I take a minute? Because I think that there are certain uh, erroneous statements made by Mamdani that need to be clarified. Unfortunately, Save Darfur representative was not here. I had hoped that they would be here. But I'd like to tell the organizers of such meetings in the future, if you're organizing anything about Sudan and Darfur in particular, please don't have three white men sitting there and talking about you know, our issues. Please, Don't. audience. Don't. Because we are here, and some of us have been involved in moving the issue around Darfur since it started. So, well, let's try secondly, not to be too mean in our ad hominem comments, but I'm let me sorry. just ask you this. Can you be pointed and say the things you think let were false yes. and just and direct those to him so that he can respond? First of all, his assumption that the Darfur coalition is all by white people and Jewish people in particular is false. Many of us Sudanese, both from the south and from Darfur, I mean from Darfur, have been working. And actually before the Darfur coalition became Darfur coalition, many of us were working. And we've been there in the middle of it. And now, actually through Save the Darfur coalition, you have Darfur leadership network in the diaspora. But of course, Mamdani will not tell you that. And he talks about international NGOs and their millions of dollars. And yet, he's at the bastion of intellectual superiority, a white institution here in Colombia. And yet, he is against anyone trying to help people in the refugees. And secondly, look at how he talks about displaced people in the refugees. They don't know anything. They believed that white people were coming to save them, as if we, as black people, and I use these words very carefully, we okay. as black people make the distinction. We don't know. We can never speak for ourselves. And I say, Colombia is next to here. How many of you here in this room go to Harlem right across from you? How many? You know? So let's really put facts. Secondly, what is so important about the numbers? Would one person who got killed make it any less a problem? Would it? Why are we so stuck on the numbers? You know? So my question to him is, in a country as divided as Sudan, in a country that has since pre-independence been in conflict with itself, where certain segments of his people have consistently been denied what Mamdani calls citizenship, what does he suggest these people should do? And what does he suggest the international community should do? Because we are part of the international community. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your, no, please, I think we really, if we can't start, if we have applause, we'll, we'll be here forever. But I think it's very important to have people, I mean, I, and to have you here, and just to, to say as well that 
every conversation can't include all subjects and all participants. But I think directing the questions to Professor Mamdani is, uh, is fair, and I'm sure he'll be happy to respond. Thank you. Uh, let me just say I never said that Save Darfur is an organization of white and Jewish people. I said Save Darfur began as an organization of religious groups, and then it expanded, and it was, I said, spectacularly successful. And it spanned into all kinds of groups. <clears throat> so let, just, just to be clear about that. But let me come to your question. In a country as divided as Sudan, uh, what should we do when certain segments have been denied citizenship? Uh, we're talking of Darfur, okay? And I'll confine myself to Darfur. As I pointed out, the conflict in Darfur began as a civil war not as an insurgency against the central government. It began as, as a civil war between two groups. The starting point was actually 1981, when a Darfuri governor was appointed. Because at that point, there developed a schism between peasants and nomads. And that schism also became one at its heart between Arab and non-Arab groups, Arab nomads and non-Arab peasants. If you go to Darfur, the poorest of the poor in Darfur are the Arab tribes of Darfur. No matter what indicator you take, whether it is income, whether it is employment, whether it is numbers in schools, whether it is number of professionals, the most wretched group are the Arab tribes of Darfur. Even if you take the peace negotiations, the groups that have been left out of the peace negotiations from Abuja onwards have been the Arab tribes of Darfur. The negotiations are between rebels, rebel movements, and the government, and the Arab tribes have been demonized as Janjaweed. So, if we're talking of citizenship, we're talking of citizenship not simply for one group in Darfur, we're talking of citizenship across the board. The answer to that cannot come from the international community. I will ask you to remember only one thing. The League of Nations promised in, after the First World War, that it would establish a trusteeship in different colonies so that the populations of these colonies could be moved to self-government. One of the colonies where they established trusteeship through Belgium was Rwanda. And the changes they brought in Rwanda were the backdrop to the genocide in Rwanda. I ask you not to listen to the promises, but to study a little bit of history I understand the pain that you feel. I have absolutely no, 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 no critique, uh, no problem. But I simply advise caution. Thank you. So let's take a few questions, if it's possible. Why don't we take a couple and come back to the okay. uh, panelists? My name is uh, Muhammad Ali. I'm from Sudan. Hold it near your mouth. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ali. Uh, I'm from Sudan from Darfur region. Um, my question to my dean, he said, the civil wars start before uh, 2003. That's not correct. My, uh, my father and my brother, they killed in 2003 by Janjaweed and the uh, Sudan government. So, and my wife is raped from of me by the Janjaweed. I'm waiting for ICC. I'm waiting for ICC. How you say it's ICC is a disaster? It's not disaster. I'm waiting for ICC. So the war is start in 2003 when the government and Janjaweed they want to kill us. That's uh, this genocide. This, uh, my village, my town is destroyed by by aircraft. That's aircraft. Aircraft does not come from Middle East. It's not come from Africa, it's not come from United States. It's come from the government. They destroyed my, my, my town. They killed my father, they killed my, my big brother. And they raped my, my wife in front of me. You say, before the war starts, the civil war there in Darfur, you are, that's not true. I'm from Darfur, I'm from Sudan, I'm Zagawa. I know what's going on exactly in Darfur. So if you got to, whatever you have with the government, if you want to talk to Darfur, you have to be honest to you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Elena Tanzi, and I'm a SEPA second year setting security policy. I'm in Mom Donnie's class and also the TA for the genocide prevention class. So, um, so you live in eternal conflict. I do. <laughs> and as a result, I have two questions. At first, I was nervous about approaching Professor Mamdani since I have to see him on Monday uh, in class. <laughs> we won't tell him about this question. All okay. right. So my question for Professor Mamdani is, in the beginning, you made the comparison between Rwanda and the, the kind of black hole of information and international media and the surprise and reaction to conflicts that were not really that surprising or that uh, new. Uh, how much international attention and what kind of international attention do you really feel is helpful or how do you think that would help because that's always a question of international will and that kind of intervention. Question for Mr. Prendergast is how would you incorporate regional organizations and African institutions into this solution? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Hamza Ibrahim. I'm from Darfur. I'm a victim of that government. But from uh, Professor and then he's talking about the history. He's not going to live with the reality. These young students, you should tell them what next step they can do. What you're talking about history, about Rwanda, that's a long time ago. But that's you want to tell these people and confusing us. And you went over there. I'm a victim of those government. And another thing I want to say, all the story you told about this audience, it's not, it's not true. These people, they can't go over there. They say, the, the war in Darfur, yes, civil war. That's not true. We know the history of Sudan. These people, they know how to read. These are students, they are adults. So you can't come sit down here, in front of these people, and you're telling us, Bashir, he didn't kill the people. He gave our people, and he's going to be accountable for But you should, I'm not insulting you, I respect you, but, Everything you said over here is not honest, as it's not true. I don't know when you go to Darfur. Our people, you see them in, in, in a refugee camps. Everybody sees those people in refugee camps. They're humble, the kids are dying, there's a bombs going around. That's what I can say. And you keep saying the citizen, they can do what they want to do, those African countries. Yes, the African countries, they can do what they want to do, but that means. You consider that there is no international community to do anything. That in America can kill anybody, nobody can do anything. African government can kill their people, nobody can come over there and defend them. That means you want to kill the institutions of justice. That's what you're saying. You say everybody can do what they want to do. That means the criminal act. And you, I'm a victim. So I'm not going to let my case is not going to away from justice in ICC. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diane Bennett, and I have two hats. One, I work for Bill Easterly at NYU, Professor Easterly, and I run the Development Research Institute there, where we are working to help understand how do we help the poor people in this world to create solutions effectively. The other is that I've worked in Sudan for the last 10 years, in South Sudan, up against the Ethiopian border near Malakal, which has been a flashpoint a number of times in the last few years and where I would predict that when and if war comes back, that's definitely going to be, play a major part. I would really love to see peace in Sudan. That is what I have worked on on the ground for the last 10 years. I'd like to hear both of you talk about what do you think is the road, briefly, to that end. How do we get there? And I believe in a, a free and open election I know the census is being taken right now in both the North and the South, and there's word on the ground that is being sabotaged by the government of Sudan, that Northerners are being moved into the Nuba Mountains so they can artificially count numbers and so on. I wonder what your understanding is of the situation and whether there's credence to the census. So why don't we uh, take some responses from the panelists? So uh, first, just a, a general Action to some of what we've just heard. It's a really different conversation, frankly, when you go to Darfur or when you go to southern Sudan, and as I've been doing for the last 25 years, uh, and talk to the million, and of course you can't have that, but representative selections of millions of people who have been uh, displaced 
such a euphemistic word, by the way, displaced um, by the uh, cycles of conflict uh, and the government of Sudan's policies uh, of, uh, of um, uh, its approach to uh, counterinsurgency. Um, I think uh, you've heard a slice of the emotion and the reaction tonight from the southern Sudanese woman at the beginning and then two of the Darfurians uh, who demand justice, frankly. And uh, that I think their voices should be factored into our assessment, all of us, each individually, as we try to understand you know, what is the way forward uh, in, in Sudan. That's why I go so frequently, because I think you have to ground test your own ideas and thoughts about how things ought to be um, uh, at to go forward. Otherwise, it's all very theoretical and academic. Um, to answer Pre Professor Mamdani's student on how to involve regional organizations, I think that the, uh, there are clear roles for, uh, for, the, uh, for the African Union. African Union is partnering with the United Nations both to sponsor the special envoy who will eventually lead the peace process in, in Darfur. And they are, of course, the main participants and contributors, as Professor Mondani said, to the uh, United Nations African Union. But there is no peace yet to keep it, so they end up uh, buttoned down in their prayer. With both government and rebel representatives in Darfur, as well as with civil society groups, you get very rapidly a sense that there are only a few issues. And those issues, there is increasing consonance around those issues. Therefore, back to point A, we've got to have a structure in place, a process in place that can get a deal on the table and then the leverage applied and the pressures and incentives applied to make sure that the parties agree and then implement. I think it's all within uh, the realm of the possible, the very near term possible. And I am, am very, very hopeful that, that uh, the, the new administration here in Washington uh, will be uh, a central catalyst for getting this uh, moving forward uh, as fast as possible to, to, to help bring about an end to the suffering of the people of Sudan. That's one point. Thank you. Um, in my very first uh, 15 minutes on the podium, um, I said that if you remove all the exaggerations, one claim stands, one fact remains, which is that in 2003-2004, the government of Sudan carried out its own war on terror. There were anything like roughly 50,000 people who died of direct violence. This is mass slaughter. It is true. Should we be less worried since the number is not 400,000? I wasn't saying that. I was simply saying, what is the politics of those who think that the higher the numbers, the better is their case? I was asking us to just be mindful of that. So the real question is not simply the history of it. We try to understand the history to answer the question, what next? What should we be doing? And to the student of Foucault, and you, uh, my <laughs> who, who is looking for a conceptual distinction, um, let me say this. Uh, the real difference between the two positions being put forth here is on the question of how to move forward. The Save Darfur position, or the position of uh, that section of the human rights movement, which is inside Save Darfur, is basically that you must focus on the atrocities and hold accountable the perpetrators of those atrocities. My position is different. I think that that's not and cannot be the priority. It cannot be the priority because violence is always driven by issues. The idea that violence is its own explanation, that the violent are simply violent and the only way to do away with violence is to do away with those who have been violent, I think is a mistaken proposition. 
If we accept that violence is driven by issues, and that if you do not deal with those issues, the cycle of violence will go on, no matter how many criminal trials you have, then the first priority has to be to address the issues, even if it means not having criminal trials. That's the position I've put forth, which is why I have argued that Darfur cannot just stand in for South Sudan, which cannot just stand in for Rwanda. We have to understand the violence contextually, because if we don't understand it contextually and historically, we will not put our finger on the issues. Third question. <clears throat> the situation in uh, um, the lady from uh, the Easterly Research Unit. Uh, the situation as we move to the referendum, what are the big questions? Um, and what's the way to peace? Uh, you know, about uh, six months ago, I think it was, um, I had a meeting with uh, the SPLA ministers in the Sudan government, about four of them. Um, and in this meeting, it became clear to me that one of the biggest issue dividing the government of Sudan, the, the, the uh, Islamist component of it, and their partners in the government, the SPLA, was the question of who should have the right to vote in the referendum on the South. Right? Um, more specifically, should South Sudanese living outside South Sudan have the right or not? And in particular, the South Sudanese who are in Khartoum, who number in the millions, IDPs, in the millions, should they have the right to vote in the referendum? One side said no, and that was the SPLA side, which said that we believe that their vote will be manipulated by the government in the north, and the northern side said, no, because if these people don't vote, we'll be left with that problem. At the end of it, if you decide to secede, we will be left with the problem of the IDPs in the north. Now, of course, the government has done its own share to influence the IDPs in the north, which is it has given them land. It has given them titles over land so that they have a stake in staying in the north. But you can expect these maneuvers. Um, on, 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 on both sides. Um, how do you get peace? I believe that the process that led to uh, the agreement in South Sudan uh, is, is the best guide. Um, that's the kind of agreement, not exactly that agreement, but that's the kind of agreement that we could do with in Darfur, keeping in mind that since Darfur is both an insurgency, counterinsurgency, and the civil war that preceded it, the issues that led to the civil war will not be solved by a South Sudan type of agreement because the issue that led to the civil war was the land question. It will have to be addressed. Difficult as it is, it will have to be addressed. Final question, Rwanda. Well, you know, I'm afraid the Safe Darfur movement has drawn simply the wrong lessons from Rwanda. The lesson they have drawn from Rwanda is that if only there had been a US-led military intervention in Rwanda, well, there would have been no genocide. I disagree completely. My own sense is that the genocide unfolded because the political settlement arrived at in Arusha did not hold. It did not hold for two reasons. One, because the right wing, the Hutu extremist group, was not given representation in Arusha and had no stake in the settlement that came out of Arusha, and secondly, because the RPF was not interested in sharing power. The RPF wanted the whole cake and nothing but the cake, and the US government intervened in Rwanda indirectly by supporting the RPF, by giving a nod to the Ugandan troops, which were part of the RPF, and basically believed that an RPF victory was necessary. The French government I will not go on and on, also intervened through Operation Turquoise. Um, the lesson of Rwanda, I believe, has to be different. The other, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, 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 regrettable 
conclusion that Saif Darfur has taken out of Rwanda, um, is that uh, sometimes situations are so urgent that you must not analyze them. You must simply act. It has split knowing from acting. Um, that knowing is a luxury in an emergency. I, I find it completely absurd. Uh, if somebody is critically ill uh, and, and, and you say, uh, there's no time for diagnosis, just prescribe. Um, and then you turn around and say, who will prescribe? Uh, only those most outraged and most concerned should prescribe. Um, it's absurd. You would never accept that in a situation where you will face the consequences of such an intervention. But that is what we are being told by those who lead the child soldiers of Save Darfur. Do we have time for another round of questions? Ten more minutes. Okay, let's have a few more questions. Let me just um, say that the voices of the victims, in, including the pain, is something that belongs here, I agree. But I think we should... Uh, consider sort of excluding words like liar and accusations of, of uh, insincerity and demonizing from comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Rahama Dafala, and I'm from Darfur. And uh, I just came from Darfur two months ago. And it's clear that uh, two panelists have been in Darfur, but both of them from different ways. Uh, maybe Bandarga has been in Darfur from chat side and uh, Professor Mandani from the Sudan government side, and he just saw the prepared IDP camps around Al Fashir town, which are prepared. We call them five stars IDP camps, and he don't know how the others living. Uh, really, I lost from my entire family 47 people, all of them direct killing by air bomb. I mean. Probably Bandarga has been in my village called Muzbet in north north part of Darfur. This is first where the drought start start from that point because I am living very close to the border of Libya, and no, not, none of them killed by the drought you mentioned, so that's not true. And also you give wrong name for the conflict, which is a civil war. No, there is yes I agree there is a small conflict between among the tribes in Darfur for years ago, but that not civil war, because that limited conflicts and people able to contend at that limit by tribal leaders. So you give me wrong. When I'm walking to this debate, I'm hoping panelists giving the correct information to these intellectuals so they can help us to get out from where dilemma we are in. But unfortunately, I really I was disappointed when Professor mentioned the history of the conflicts and given wrong name and given these intellectuals the wrong information. Thank you. For, no, no, I didn't come to my question yet. Oh, well, you know what? There's no longer any time, I'm afraid. I'm serious. We have, to, we have 10 minutes for everybody else to be able to present their okay. questions. So if you have, can get one it out minute, one in minute. half a second, that's fine. Okay. How many people must be killed so we're going to name it genocide? First one. Thanks. Second one. No, thank you. Yes, uh, hi, my name is Rhonda Chafai. I am a student in Columbia College. And I have two questions, very brief questions, regarding the globalization of the Darfur issue. Uh, my first question is that it was reported two months ago that a group of Somali pirates seized a Ukrainian ship carrying $3.2 million worth of arms for southern Sudan. And my question is that can we draw any conclusions or can anything be said about the globalization of not only the southern, southern Sudanese question, but also the Darfur issue uh, based on this recent development? And then my second question is somewhat related. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion surrounding the increased plausibility of a southern secession, southern secession in Sudan. And my question is, is there anything at stake? What is at stake if southern Sudan is to secede in the near future? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Edib Yusuf. I'm working for uh, an organization called Sudan Social Development Organization, Sudo. That is one of the organizations uh, were closed down by the Sudanese government. Uh, being working in Darfur and hearing uh, uh, Professor Mohammedani is uh, speaking, I think he's defending the Sudanese government uh, more than the Sudanese government themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> another question for John Brandegas. 
uh, I heard you speaking about uh, uh, the way forward. I also hear that this uh, uh, peace process that carried out by the American uh, and is supposed to take place in, in Nairobi, Kenya. Is this the same way that you are talking about? or this? The peace process what? Whether it's the one that's planned for Nairobi, meetings in Nairobi. Yeah, is it the same thing that you're talking about, or this is different, different thing? Okay. Thank you. I'm Sharon Beth Long, and I'm with the New York City Coalition for Darfur, uh, part of the Save Darfur movement. Um, actually, I want to thank uh, Dr. Mandani uh, for his uh, nuanced um, analysis of uh, the movement. Uh, it, it gave me... Uh, uh, some pause and some things to uh, think about. Um, my question uh, is, does Dr. Mandani uh, think that uh, the ICC indictment uh, might lead to uh, more uh, revenge um, against civilians or uh, have a, a backlash uh, against civilians? Uh, second, uh, what, does, uh, what does both Dr. Mandani and Dr. Prendergast uh, think of the divestment movement, especially directed at China. A and third, uh, Dr. Prendergast mentioned um, areas of consensus. Uh, what should uh, the Save Darfur movement and international governments want to see in a, a peace agreement? What would cause, what type of agreement would cause both sides to put down their arms? So let's hear though from the last people who are standing, and then we may not get to all of the answers, but let's with the, those just the ones who are still standing. Um, yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, so first of all, uh, Professor Mamdani, I agree uh, with the analogy that you gave. Thirty-five minutes. But I also think that there are instances when um, when a person's situation is very critical, doctors try to sedate the person or do something in order to keep the person stabilized before they finally uh, put the knife on the person to operate. And I think that is basically what everyone is asking for, that instead of waiting um, uh, and you know, arguing about and theorizing, why don't we try to figure out how the um, uh, blood pour can be halted momentarily while people try to agree. The other thing that I also just want to ask is, um, basically, I understand that the US uh, intervention, I mean, everyone looks uh, upon US intervention with so much suspicion. However, if you want to look at what happened recently in um, Zimbabwe, where Mugabe basically has been allowed to uh, take the helm of affairs, you can, we all realize that some way, somehow, uh, Mugabe, because, of the, you know, because he's the incumbent, already had so much power, he is basically monopolizing um, the transference of power. And we also understand that based on the history of colonialism and the uh, business relations between a lot of international communities and African countries, somewhere, somehow, there is always going to be a foreign country that is influencing whoever the local government is. So Mugabe, for instance, is receiving arms from China. And we cannot say that you know, another foreign country shouldn't intervene so that there is um, a, a balance of power. So I just want to know how you um, analyze the international um, uh, levels of analysis involved. And then I guess the last point. No, no, that's it. Thank you very much. So very quickly, because I see that I'm actually trying the patience of the panelists okay. along with My everyone else. My name is Sumit. I'm in the Liberal Studies Human Rights Program over here at Columbia. Uh, <laughs> Professor Mumdani, my question is specifically for you. You differentiated between the direct killings that are taking place on the ground. Slow, and, slowly, slowly. And, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the deaths that are taking place due to other external factors I, like. I, I, I didn't understand what you're saying. I'll, I'll start over. You differentiate, differentiated between the direct killings that are taking place on the ground and other causes, such as the desertification of the Sahara Desert. Uh, and then just keeping in mind that the crime of genocide is, does not just encompass direct deaths, it actually also encompasses uh, the critical element of creating conditions uh, calculated to bring about the destruction of life. And noting that Currently, aid groups have been expelled, and so many people in these refugee camps de depend on them for their, for their, for their livelihoods to stay alive. Uh, is this not furthering the genocide? That's my question for you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Dina Guzder, and um, I attended the college, the journalism school, and the School of International and Public Affairs. 
And uh, when I first arrived at Columbia six years ago, I became immediately involved in the anti-war coalition. And the reason why I bring up this point is because I do think it's incredibly fascinating how this movement around Darfur has um, evolved. And this question is for Mr. Prendergast. And I have no doubt that you share my concern for suffering people, as I believe most people in this auditorium do. do. But I am curious why you think that this cause in particular, especially how it's been framed in very stark terms about an oppressor and an oppressed, about people who can externally be redeemed by Western intervention, has taken such a toll on the public imagination and galvanized so many people for right or wrong reasons compared to the Iraq war where our very direct tax dollars are paying for cluster munitions, white phosphorus, and according to the New England Journal of Medicine, have killed a million people. Thank you. As I said, we may not get to all of the answers, but it looks like some people are sitting tight and waiting, so. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's interesting. The, the, go back to, we have a bunch of things here. Co Columbia's college student uh, about the pirates and the, t and the, uh, the ship that was um, uh, captured, that had the tanks in it for the SPLA, destined for the SPLA. Everyone knows, I think, that uh, the government, the, the actual the ruling party, the National Congress Party, and the SPLM are both uh, importing weapons uh, in advance of uh, what they both believe may be a return to war if the referendum doesn't occur. Um, there's a, a, an oil-fueled arms race that is continuing. Um, I, the only thing that we learned from that incident is the SPLA's purchases may be not so smart because buying those kinds of tanks in that terrain is not what they <laughs> need to be doing. So uh, that's all I get out of that. Um, what is at stake for the referendum, much more important question, is uh, that the, um, uh, every Southerner, every Southern Sudanese is holding their breath uh, for this referendum. It's, it's referendum or war uh, for most Southerners. They will go back to war. Uh, uh, they will do so regretfully, but they will go. Um, if this referendum doesn't occur, the stakes are, are breathtakingly high. And uh, that's why just as, and back to your question earlier, Peter, and just as much as we have to work uh, assiduously globally for a peace in Darfur, we similarly have to work equally for uh, the implementation of that peace deal between the North and the South and getting that referendum uh, up and, and held, uh, otherwise there will be a war much bigger than that that exists in Darfur today that resumes in the south. Um, I don't know about those Nairobi talks, but if you want to come up afterwards, we can try to figure out what you meant by that. Uh, I just don't know what they are. The third question that I see is this question about the divestment uh, and China, and I think it's an important tool because what divestment has done over the last few years, it has vested local communities around the United States, whether they're universities or, or uh, municipalities or states, where local activists can try to make a difference right there in their own backyard with respect to the, um, the uh, investment decisions that either their state, their city, or their educational institution uh, makes with, you know, and so they can encourage that the, uh, the investments are not going to f support in any way, shape, or form the government of Sudan and the, uh, and the violence that it has been uh, culpable in perpetrating in Sudan, in Darfur. So I think those uh, that have been very, very well, uh, it's been a very important part of the uh, movement. Um, uh, structure, substance of a peace deal in Darfur, I think the, as I said, they're, they're, the, the issues are clarifying. Um, dismantling of the paramilitary infrastructures, otherwise known as Janjaweed, uh, dealing with um, some of the essential power and wealth sharing elements of a uh, deal for the Darfurians, some regional, additional regional autonomy. And then what may be the most important issue for every and any Darfurian that you speak to is some measure of individual compensation for the uh, losses. Uh, this is a, a core demand of uh, every Darfurian I've ever spoken to in Darfur and in the refugee camps. Um, and it is a symbolic as well as real in the sense that 
uh, having lost everything as a result of the government's counterinsurgency strategy. They want, and it's not, they don't want a World Bank trust fund or something like that to pay. To, to do development projects. They want the government of Sudan as the, uh, as the principal perpetrator of the violence in Darfur that drove people into the camps for the first two or three years of this conflict to pay individual compensation to people who are aggrieved. And the government has already accepted this in principle. It's then a question simply of negotiating numbers. Is it 30 million, 300 million, what? And that is going to be the essence of the, of the, uh, of the peace process. Thank you. Um, well, I guess let me repeat that uh, I didn't go to Darfur with the government of Sudan. I went with the African Union. Um, I didn't say that the conflict in Darfur is a civil war. I said it began as a civil war. Okay. It is both an insurgency and a counterinsurgency. And it was a civil war which has now fueled the insurgency and the counterinsurgency. But let me make a more substantive point. Um, the role of victims uh, in a solution, in a conflict. Um, I think this question and the answer to this question has to do with our understanding of the role of history and the relationship between history and the future. Now, I have been both surprised um, and uh, reassured uh, by victim voices here uh, who have said, let's forget history. Let's just talk about the future itself. Um, the reason I've been reassured is because usually victims don't want to forget history. If you remember South Africa, and remember the Steve Biko trial, uh, the Steve Biko trial, the murderers of Steve Biko were known. The Supreme Court, the court, threw it out, basically because it would have undermined the political settlement in South Africa. The Magnus Milan trial, Magnus Milan's role in counterinsurgency and everything was well known, but it was thrown out. Again, because of presumably larger interests and because history must be subordinated to the future if we are to have a future. Otherwise, we will have endless cycles of revenge. How many people must be killed before we call this a genocide? The interesting thing is the genocide is not about the numbers killed. Read the report of the UN Commission on Darfur and compare it with the ICC prosecutor's report. The disagreement is not about numbers. The disagreement is about what to call it. Right? Um, think, about, think about violence in contemporary conflicts. Um, I, I ask you to consider a couple of facts. One, that modern wars and modern conflicts have become total wars. Um, it, they are no longer wars just between uh, armies on two sides. Uh, they are wars where armies attack not only the opposing army, but the entire economic infrastructure and civilian infrastructure. Now, we have a language where we have different words for some killings. We call them genocide, some mass killings and different words for other mass killings, which we call war or counterinsurgency. I think we are in danger of distinguishing normal violence from bad violence. And we are in danger of accepting certain kinds of violence as normal, as maybe even good violence, because they are the antidote to bad violence. I just ask you to, to, to think about this more. Next question, direct killings and other causes. All I'm saying is uh, that there have been multiple causes. Let's just recognize that. Right? It's not simply spillover effect of the violence because the drought and desertification preceded the violence and will continue after the violence is stopped. Right? And the deaths from it will continue after the violence is stopped, just as the causes of the civil war will continue even when the counterinsurgency and the insurgency have stopped. 
And do we want to wait until the facts remind us of the case, or do we want to recognize that these are, no matter how entangled they are, they are analytically separate issues which need to be separately considered. Um, China. And, well, you know, look, uh, I don't know why people are so hyped up about China. I mean, why? Look, uh, there's a resource conflict. The U.S. is neck deep in Chad. Right? American oil companies are neck deep in Chad. And, Chi and, 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 and China is neck deep in Sudan. Right? They're both having access to oil in these two neighboring countries. If you want to talk of provision of military hardware, everybody knows that half the money spent in this world on military equipment is spent by the US Army. The rest of the world put together barely equals US military expenditure. So if you want to do away with war and violence, start at home. What's this China about? Complete diversion. Total diversion, total lack of understanding of what the global situation is but pointing to a real possible danger. And the real possible danger is that we are in a transitional situation with a declining power and a rising power. And we need all the sanity we can possess to not beef up things and not hype up things. Um, and and uh, I, I, hope, I hope we can muster that sanity. Uh, final, uh, Zimbabwe and Kenya. Look, Mugabe. Okay, Mugabe, Zimbabwe. Uh, look here, there were elections in both these places, Zimbabwe and Kenya. There were charges of rigging. Um, the charge uh, uh, of rigging in Kenya was greater than in Zimbabwe. There was violence that followed the election. The numbers of people killed in Kenya were much more than in Zimbabwe. And yet the US government, the British government, everybody put together Right, prevailed on the different parties in Kenya to come together in a coalition government. But they did their utmost to prevent the adversaries in Zimbabwe from coming together in a coalition government. The only reason there's been a coalition in Zimbabwe is because the region, Southern Africa in particular, stood against Western pressure. I believe that a coalition government in a divided country because no matter whose figures you take, the figures were roughly 50%, give or take, a few percent on one side, 50% on the other side. This is a divided country. You have to have shared power. You can't have winner take all. That is a recipe for restarting the civil war. Same problem in any other continuing conflict like Darfur. Thank you. Let me thank uh, the participants, the, the panelists, and uh, thank you to the audience. This was really a pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Sorry about that. Mumford, really, when I kept having the questions coming on, it was a little cruel. Was it like Michigan and some of those places for the same stuff? Yeah, I think that.